Hello, oral surgery colleagues, and welcome to the Oral Surgery Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Richard Moore, an oral surgeon based in the United Kingdom. The aim of this podcast channel is to discuss ways of improving practice in oral surgery, thereby creating a better journey and patient experience, and allowing us as clinicians to become better oral surgeons. All discussions on this channel are based on personal experience and opinions, which should be thought-provoking and supplemented with further research and evidence-based practice. Without further ado, let's jump into this podcast. Hello, so here we are with Dr. Bradley Lander. Uh, so hi, Brad. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, how are you? I'm very, really good, actually, and it's great to have you on. Um, t- we're going to go a little bit off piece today, um, and we're going to talk a bit about perio, but I, I guess more importantly, uh, I taught you as an undergraduate in the first year that I'd started at the uni, so I'm not going to claim credit for where you are now, but I think... Um, Maybe I might have had a little bit of influence. So I think uh, for those that don't know you, it would just be nice to have a little bit of an introduction as to your career to date, because I think this will be quite unique and interesting, particularly for for guys in the UK. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Th- thank you so much for for having me. Um, yeah, you 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 say that uh, it was your first year. Um, when I remember when I first met you, it was actually the first time I ever did any kind of dental surgery. So. Uh, I'm not going to not going to forget that anytime soon. Um, so that was a, a very good memory. But um, yeah, so I, I um, for those listening, I'm Bradley. I graduated in 2018 from the University of Leeds. Um, after graduating, I did my foundation training in the Northwest London scheme in a practice, um, the high needs practice in Harrow. Uh, and when when I was there, I realised that. Uh, you know, dent- dental school is very tough, but you, you, it's really important that you gain a variety in all the different disciplines in dentistry. What I found was that uh, I was, I was, you know, I, I fresh out of dental school, you don't have much experience. I, I wasn't I didn't find I was very confident in, in what I was able to do. Um, and I realized at that time uh, that I maybe would be better suited to focusing on, on one thing and really excelling at one thing. So I was looking at my um, opportunities to um, specialize and really in the UK, you have to follow the set path of, you know, doing DCT for at least, you know, they, they say one year, but at least really two years to become a strong candidate. Yeah, yeah um, definitely. And then uh, you know, you know more than me, but I was just looking at this doing DCT for two, if not three years, and then getting onto the, the program. I just felt that I, I wanted to do, something a bit sooner. So I, I looked at options outside of the UK uh, and managed to find so many amazing opportunities abroad. So that's, that's just like a very, very brief overview um, of, of the journey. But um, yeah, definitely it, when, when, I, when I was at Leeds, it's very funny because I tell, I tell my friends two things is the first thing was that when I graduate, I'm done with school and I'm never going to study <laughs> uh, again. And the second thing, so I'm, I'm from Hertfordshire, just outside of London. And I was convinced that I was going to live in London and stay there. So neither of those promises I kept. Um, So it's interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you say you wanted to specialise sooner, having, um, because obviously we'll come on in a second to the fact you're in the States, and I'm very envious of that. Um, But the fact that after after foundation training, you felt you were kind of ready to to, to focus your training in a, in a specialty. Whereas, you know, most people would say, you know, you really need to have a couple of years under your belt of broad training. You know, if you do DCT, is it going to be max facts, restorative or different yeah. specialties? Yeah. But you obviously felt that at the end of foundation training, and that might just be a personal and individual drive and the way you, you function that actually that's for me and I'm going to go and, and, and go down that, that path. So that's quite interesting. I think a lot of people, are not confused yeah, I, but I, unsure I, I you know what it was i think it was a, a combination of experiences that made me lead to looking at the options outside you know and, and when you're in dental school you had this um you have this idea of what life is going to be like and you know myself i when i did work experience at dental practices they usually were like you know my dentist who had been established for 20 25 years you, you're looking at like very very when you do work experience, you're usually with the people who are in the middle of their careers or if, if not the end of their careers. Whereas when you're at the start of your career, it's very, very different. So 
um, it, it was a number of experiences. What, what something I, I really didn't quite like um, was that, for example, at university, I, I did two molar root canals, which was a fair, fair amount of experience compared to some of the, the, mm. my other students. But um, I was sitting there day one in practice. And as a professional dentist, I'd only ever done this thing twice. Um, yeah. And I, I, I always tell this to, you know, family friends. I said, well, what, what would you do if you get on, on a plane and the pilot says to you, hey, guys, I'm a professional pilot, but I've only ever flown a plane twice. And and that that's just how I felt at the time. So I was thinking that, um, you know, what are what are my um, my options to, to improve that? Now, you can um, obviously go and do loads of um, CPD and courses like that. But I, I just felt I'd spent so uh, much of my time, you know, five years um, left my friends and my family to dedicate it to, to dentistry. And I didn't really graduate with what I thought I would. And, and that's just not, not, um, that's just sort of my, um, I don't know what the right word, like I, I went into dental school thinking, yeah. you know, that I would come out and then I looking at the, these people who I, who I'd seen who were in the middle of their careers or at the end of their careers thinking that's what life would be like, but it's quite, it's quite the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, not a criticism of, of training, is it? it it's know, just no, how it is. Yeah. And it, it, you obviously Absolutely. had a different perspective I mean, and different how, expectations. How many, how many people do you know who do work experience with people two or three years or even five years out of university? Yeah, it's they, rare, you know, isn't they, it? They're, they're looking at like the specialist practice or their family dentist or it's, it's very, it's very rare. So that, and, and that's not really the true picture of the, the whole career, you know, it's taking someone yeah. in there. In their, yeah. in their peak so that was just my, my experience but an, another thing um so one of the reasons which I, I got into dentistry was i really like the interpersonal relationships you can have with with the dentist so um my dentist i went to see him ever since you know i can remember he saw me grow up he knew everything about me he knew everything about my family mm-hmm. um and what in, in our practice um in foundation training towards the end of the year i was seeing you know, between 20 and 30 patients a day and in an eight hour day, it works out something like 23 mm-hmm. minutes per appointment. You just don't have that, that time no. to spend with the patients. And, um, I, it's funny what one, when people show where they work, they usually show either a practice chair or a nice view out the window. Um, and what I remember most about the practice we worked at, uh, that I worked at was in the reception, there was a horseshoe, um, sofa. And it was, you know, the patient closest on the right side would come upstairs, you'd give them an ID block, they'd go and sit downstairs on the left side of the room, <laughs> and the next person come in and then the ne- and so forth. And it was like this, you know, um, conveyor belt of yeah. patients. And, and that's just sometimes the reality of working in a high needs practice. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I looked at this and I just felt like everything I was doing in this system was geared up to just getting volume. And I, I felt like I was... I wasn't doing the dentistry, which I, you know, thought I, you would. Yeah. I thought I would. And I, I wasn't having the, I, I didn't see myself in the career where I was happy and thriving. So it was the, these experience sort of led me to look at the different options. Um, so it wasn't that like I graduated dental school and knew that I wanted to specialize. I just wanted more than what I had. Yeah. And I felt that me trying to focus, you know, I wasn't very good at, at, at anything and me trying to improve everything, you know, being an expert at root canals, being an expert at dentures, being an expert um, uh, at crown preps, it was very difficult. I found myself, just my personality, I'm better just focusing on one thing um, and just being really, really um, focused and, and trying to improve myself in one area. And I, I really respect um, general dentists. Uh, it's just something I couldn't do. Um, I just wasn't versatile enough, I guess. Um, but that, that, again, that's just sort of the, the experiences I had that made me realize very quickly that, um, I don't see myself, uh, in this sort of career path for too much longer. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And, and, but you did do DCT. Am, am I right in saying that? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, um, how it works is because the, um, the U S academic year starts in July. So I applied for perio in the u.s in around june of my foundation training year and this was to start the next july um, okay so 12 so, months later 
12 months later, exactly. So then DCT starts in September and yeah. ends in August. So I ended my DCT halfway through. I didn't get the certificate because I didn't complete it. Okay. I left, I left around nine months through. Um, but it, you know, DCT I think is, um, is worthwhile doing. Um, actually I was fortunate, um, because I had you at Leeds and you, you, you know, you gave me a lot of surgical experience. I remember you used to let me come in, uh, on times where I wasn't timetabled to be in and, and what, and observe and, and get to learn, um, some surgical, um, surgical skills. So, um, I, I did have a little bit of surgical experience. The thing with DCT, which I found is, although it was great in, um, in some areas, a lot of the stuff I was doing is, is largely unrelated to, to perio. And ideally I knew that I wanted to, or ultimately I wanted to end up in perio. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I was very, I, I enjoyed DCT. I think it was useful and it's great for people who don't know what they, they want to do. I think it gives you, um, a broader scope, um, of, of just practice. It gives you so many yeah. different options. Uh, but I think if you know what you want to do, um, for example, I spent a lot of the, a lot of the time I was, you know, suturing facial wounds, dealing with drunk patients and that, and that kind of thing in the ER, but, um, or A&E. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, we already slipped in. I know, I know. <laughs> what, what did we go? We went seven minutes without Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to mark these down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, so, um, yeah, I spent a lot of the time uh, stitching uh, facial wounds. But, you know, when you're trying to um, uh, suture uh, soft tissue graft or something, it's a completely different yeah. uh, skill set. Yeah. And I actually, I found because of how, how the DCT was set up, when a lot of it is, you know, working 8 p.m. to 8 in the morning, um, unsupervised, I picked mm. up a lot of bad habits. Uh, my suturing, it took me a long time to drop those bad habits because I was so <laughs> used to it. Um, so, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was... A, good thing to do I, I wouldn't ever say like you know you shouldn't do it I think it's very it depends on where you are and, and what your motivations are yeah I, I think it's important for I mean if I if I was in charge I would say that you, you know you, everybody should do that year in practice and year in hospital to give you that broad foundation of training irrespective of where you go after that so I think I think you did the right well you did do the right thing definitely um but what's, we should talk. What's sorry, 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 what, what's really interesting is that um, so one of the reasons why I looked at the US is just they come from uh, they come from dental school and the day after they graduate dental school with a zero surgical experience they start their residency and that can right. be in anything. Um, so like um, my co-residents, some of them started the perio program having never um, raised a flat. Oh, so that's interesting. It's, it's very, very different to the UK and they take the mentality that they, they don't want people, um, necessarily to have surgical experience in different areas because they want to teach them their to focus. Yeah. Okay. Um, having, on the other hand, you have like, so in, in my cohort, there's nine of us, there's, um, people straight out of dental school. And there's also people who have already done perio um, speciality training in different countries and they're trying to get a license in the u.s so there's a real okay. mix of, of of ages of people of backgrounds of skill sets so um yeah i i think uh sometimes or how i felt anyway that the uk system can be a little bit too rigid mm. um so i just i like that there was this um, open-mindedness I think the other thing for me is that the US system compared to the the UK, the majority of UK graduates will will have gone straight through, you know, sixth form dental school and then straight out the other end. And I think in my experience when I was in the States, that that element of maturity and life experience, because they've done it as a postgrad, is different. So the candidates that come out of dental school are a little bit older, a little bit more mature and have yeah, some more life yeah. experience compare. So they, they may be more focused to go straight into a residency program. That's, that's it, absolutely. That's ab I, as I opposed to the UK. Yeah. yeah um, so one, one of the things I noticed here is, you know, when, because we, when I, I moved here, we, it was during uh, COVID. So what they, they took the mentality that anytime a patient could be in the chair, we, we can't have classes. So just to maximize patient um, okay. contact time. And, 
so we used to the first patient used to start at 7 30 so we used to be in at like 6 30 or 7 and i was thinking i, I remember we had one nine o'clock lecture on a friday in leeds and i think three people used to turn up <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i don't know i don't know how many people would turn up if it was a 7 30 start so there there is a difference yeah huge um, i mean having said that i've started a breakfast club for our registrars and um at half seven and actually they all turned up the first week i did provide you know pastries and things but i think there is it's all about drive isn't it and and yeah. people if you really want to do some you'll commit but the mentality in the States is very different. I mean, I remember doing 7 a.m. teaching in Chicago, and it was like, wow, this this would never happen in, in a but even in, Even the undergrads, they, they're there at 7.30. Yeah, and it's maximizing yeah. that learning experience, isn't it? Um, yeah, for sure. But that, it's, it's totally different, and it's just different cultures. Um, so let, sure. let's talk about one of the really important things is how you got to the U.S., not, not you know, what flight you took, but how, <laughs> how you... It's good uh, you specified that because I, I would have told you the flight. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how you went about, because, uh, you know, many people will say, I get students asking me all the time, oh, I really want to go and work abroad. Where can I work? And it's obviously very difficult with a BDS or BCHD working. At, and, and Europe, obviously, is different. Australia is probably the, the commonest and most straightforward. But to go to the States is is very difficult so, so th this is a, this is a great question and I, I i do get asked this a lot um actually i haven't been completely honest so i actually interviewed at the university of sydney before i got into the states so okay. i remember it was it was a zoom call at four o'clock in the morning um <laughs> and the first question they asked me was how many and this is in my foundation year i think i was it, may, it must have been maybe december so two months after or three no january so three months three or four months after I'd started. And the first question they asked me was how many implants I've placed. Obviously coming out of dental school and foundation training, the answer is zero. Yeah. They then asked me, how do I manage patients with peri-implantitis? Again, in NHS practice, a high needs area, the answer is zero. Um, they were asking me a few other questions. Um, and then I could tell, you know, I, I could tell very quickly on uh, early on that I wasn't the right candidate that they were looking for. Sure. Um, so there is this concept, uh, you know, this idea that in the U.S. is very, very difficult to apply uh, to get into. I just thought I would, um, I thought I would apply, and just to see, you know, the worst case that happens is that I, I get rejected, but I'm not in any worse situation in terms of my career in England. Yeah. Um, I still, you know, I'm still going to carry on with foundation training and so forth. And when bef I, when bef I, just sorry. before you go any further. Did you have in the back of your mind, because obviously there's a huge financial implication for this, isn't there? Yeah, did you, and I, You know, it's not a personal question about personal finance, but did you think, you know, how am I going to afford this? Or had you, did you already have yeah. the funds for that? Or was it a question of, I'm just going to get in somewhere and then think about that? So, um, again, it's another great question. I, I haven't, again, I missed parts of the story. So I was looking at, uh, options abroad. I applied for Australia, didn't get in. I then had a study day as part of my foundation training with a prosthodontist called Rishi Patel. Uh, Rishi Patel, he was in, I think he went to Loma Linda and now he works in um, in London. And he, I asked him, I said, look, how do you, how do you, how are you able to afford to go to the US? And he was telling me at his, um, in his dental school when he was a resident, um, he actually used to get paid to do his training because what one key difference in the UK and the US, in the UK when the patients come in, they don't pay. Everything is free in the dental hospital. Yeah. In the US, every patient is paying. So what they did in his program is they would give him a percentage of every piece of treatment he did. He would get something right. from it and okay. it would effectively cover his tuition fee. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so there are those type of schools. Anyway, I started speaking to him more, and this was just literally a conversation over lunch. Um, and he put me in touch with um, another guy called Kevin Luan. Kevin Luan, he went to uh, King's. I think he graduated in 2012. So just a year before I started dentistry. Um, and Kevin actually went to uh, Penn. He did Perry at Penn, and he, he was the first ever dentist to get this scholarship, this type of scholarship called the Turon Award. Um, so I, I emailed him, 
Um, you know, the first email, he, he didn't reply. Uh, <laughs> sec- second email, um, I followed up, he did reply. And it turns out that he, uh, he turns out that he was coming to London the next week or something. So we ended up meeting up and, and he really um, just sort of showed me that it was possible to, to get in. Um, fast forward um, a few months, I sent the application in and I'd interviewed at the first place I interviewed actually was Chicago, UIC. Mm. And the, the first question they asked me was, well, you have, you have to do, you know, th- th- we'll talk about the application process in a sec, but the first thing they said to me, they said, um, well, actually, the first thing they said to me, they, they laughed at me because I had to do an in- English exam, believe it or not, <laughs> and I didn't get full marks. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the first thing they said. That was a good icebreaker. But the second thing they, they asked me, they said, why doesn't anyone from the UK ever apply? And that really like blew my, blew my mind. And I, I was thinking, you know, I, everyone has always said, oh, it's so hard and we're not, mm. we're not yeah. welcome there and they make it so difficult. But meanwhile, when I went to this interview, it was literally the first question that was asked. Um, so I, yeah, I don't, I, I think actually in my experience, I had quite the opposite where Australia, I was not the right candidate. Um, well, whereas in the US, they really wanted someone who had no no experience so mm. that they could teach them yeah. their ways and, and yeah. really um, develop uh, their skill set. So actually, I found in, in my experience, I found a big difference. I find that the, the thing that people, do, and this is something that Kevin said to me when I first met him, he said that so many people reach out to him, as, as they do to me now, um, asking how to do it, how to do it. And one of the hardest things about it is not what you have to do to get in it's just doing the application it, it, it's quite a long process you have to send transcripts and all that kind of thing but people they, they don't just do it they just need to just do the application and you'll be surprised i think um since i've since i've come to the us i've been giving this presentation on, on specializing abroad and um in the past before i joined in the past 10 years one person had had got this scholarship uh, to come um, and then last year, we've got a guy now from, uh, I think Kings as well as he's doing the pros program. And then next year we have, um, a, a, another a female, she's joining the Perio program from the UK. Um, so slowly and slowly mm, uh, more people from the UK are becoming more aware of the opportunities, but, yeah. um, I don't think, I honestly think like. Just, just to put it into perspective, I had, so I interviewed at UIC, I interviewed at Columbia and I interviewed at Penn. So I had in total, I had something like 21 interviews. I got asked, I got asked one clinical question and I got it wrong. The rest were all, the rest were all about why I wanted to come to the U S what I think I, like whether, you know, where, where I see myself going. And it was more about. Whereas in the UK, you have to demonstrate your patient communication skills. You have to do an SJT. Yeah. All yeah. of these, all of these situations, I found it quite unpredictable, and there's no way really to separate two people who have been through the same system. It, it's a really different process, isn't it? It's almost like the old school medical exactly, dental interviews. It's, it's, it's traditional. It's very. And traditional. let's let's just let's just find out about you as a candidate, and are you the kind of person that's going to fit in here, and can we train you? Because Absolutely. you should, ha- you know, if you've got the degree, technically you should have the ability, but it's you as a person. And, and this is something which I really looked at, you know, the, the unpredictability of getting a foundation place. You know, you, you, mm. you, are, you said yeah. there's a hundred people in your year. You've all been through the same curriculum. You should all have the same skill set. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, there's going to be some slight variation, but how, how do you differentiate, you know, one person from the next? And really, they don't, they don't do it very well well because it's very it's almost impossible to do yeah but what what you know what they have is i think it's a system in place and they need to have some sort of system because it's better than you know than people just calling their friends and and that kind of thing but um this this is something i looked at thinking okay so i was fortunate in my first year i I escaped and managed to get a a place that i I was happy with but you know with dct it's so unpredictable Mm. and there's no way to differentiate yourself and then i i also um, on, the, on the other hand, I was like, okay, well, if I apply in the US, no one else is going to have my kind of story. I'm, I'm automatically have a, a unique selling point. I'm automatically yeah, different yeah. from 99% of the, the applicants. So I, after this interview with UIC, um, I gained a lot of confidence. And um, I actually, I took a massive risk. So you, how, how the application process works. In, in 
the US, there's either uh, two, two application processes. One is called Match, and Match is very similar to like UCAS, where you will apply and then you rank your universities and then you will um, wake up on a results day and find out if you've got into one, but you don't hear back from the others. Like you have a round of interviews and then, and then you get in. The other is non-match, which is more traditional, where you literally have the interview and then you get told a day or two later whether you get offered a place. Now, the reason why they do non-match is because some of the, you know, the non-Ivy League universities, they will offer their places before the match places so that they can try and get some of the strong candidates, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so UIC actually offered me a place. I, I landed, I, I had the interview on a Tuesday and by the time I got home on a Wednesday, they'd already offered me a place. But I, I knew I had my interviews from Penn and Columbia coming up. Um, now, UIC is, is not Ivy League, so it's, it's much uh, more affordable. I still would need some additional financial support, but it wouldn't be as dependable as getting this, this really um, prestige scholarship. And so I had to make a decision whether or not I was going to accept the place at UIC or whether I was going to reject it and take a chance of me getting into Penn and getting the scholarship. Yeah. So it was like, um, but you know, when, when I heard, when I heard what they were telling me at this interview that, you know, no one from the UK was applying, it gave me re really, you know, a lot of confidence that, um, actually I'm in quite a unique position here and I, I might have something to offer. Um, but that's just a brief, brief overview. I, I don't know if that's too much. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And and the just to touch on the scholarship because obviously that's um, that that's a UK based scholarship or is that a US? Yeah, so I mean, there, there are this and this is another thing in the UK. They don't have any scholarships. You know, you have to fund your your speciality training mm. unless you work in the the hospital pathway. Um, yeah. But in the US, there are. I mean, I don't even know all of the scholarships that exist. There are so many. Um, so I'm on one type of scholarship, but I, you know, there are there are at least at least 10 scholarships that would support dentists. Right. Um, so the scholarship I was able to receive um, is called the Turin Award, T-H-O-U-R-O-N, for anyone who wants to look it up. Um, and it's it's a exchange program. It was set up in the 1950s by a family called the Turin family. Um, and the, what they wanted to do was to increase the educational opportunities between the US and the UK. So they send post UK postgraduates to Penn and Penn postgraduates to anywhere in the UK. So typically, they, you know, they send um, up to 10 people um, each way per year. Okay. Um, and they'll, they'll pay the tuition for two full years. Um, and then they also give you a stipend, uh, which is actually more generous than my NHS salary, which helps, you know, uh, living expenses and, and sure. books yeah. and things like that. So uh, I'm, very, I'm very fortunate to, to have these uh, opportunities um, but it, it's one yeah it's it's the most amazing scholarship uh, the family are incredibly supportive and the, the type of networks and community yeah. aspect is is amazing it, it's kind of really refreshing to hear um, somebody so engrossed and enthusiastic about their career from such an early stage because um, I think I think it's quite easy just to get stuck in that that rut, isn't it? And absolutely. And you obviously, this, is, this is something I, I completely I, I found in England. It's like it's it's very rigid, and you just you can get kind of you know how how I looked at it was like you may have someone in foundation training who's very passionate about doing a certain speciality, and they really really want to do it. But when they go to apply, yeah. there's so many people who have been you know say DCT threes so have <clears> been through the system that are stronger candidates, but it, it yeah. doesn't say. That just because they've been in DCT three and that whole pathway doesn't mean they're more passionate or they're going to be better periodontists or mm. or better specialists. It just means they're further in the system. Yeah. And then for someone who you know has is, is really eager to get going, they could be disincentivized to go deincentivized. The word is um, to go to to not pursue speciality training because they don't want to risk going through national recruitment. They don't want to risk leaving their friends and family. They don't. And then there's there's a and a group of people who are lost, who could be provide an excellent yeah, service definitely. in this country, yeah. um, and that was something which, which yeah, I, I really thought about. So I'm really passionate about trying to increase these opportunities because yeah. I, I, I was fortunate to find this this pathway myself, 
um, but it wasn't without the help of being guided by, as I say, Rishi Patel, Kevin yeah. Durant. Um, but I'm really passionate about trying to give people that option. I'm not saying it's, one is better or the other. It's just another. Well, no, it's it, and, it, and it's it's obviously worked for you. But it's really interesting to hear that the US schools would encourage UK graduates to apply because that's something that that is new to me. Not not that I you know feel that I've got my finger on the pulse with training in the US, but so I mean it's. 2001 when I was at UIC so it's a long time ago and the, the, there was an encouragement to apply but it was it was just when I looked at it it was just such a long winded process and obviously the financial implications were huge and I, you know I wasn't aware of things like grants and scholarships so yeah. it's it's quite interesting to hear that the US schools are actually, you know, when you, you're a UK graduate, we'd we'd welcome an application almost. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I also find, um, so for, for Perio, the, the American Academy of Periodontology, they have on their website, they have a list of every single program in the US and every, you know, everything you need to know in terms of how much it's going to cost, whether you get paid, because there are some programs that will actually give you a, a stipend just to pay you. Right. Um, um, there are other. They'll tell you the entry requirements. Whether they, because some schools don't accept international students. Okay. Um, they'll also give you a rough idea of how much surgical experience you're going to get. What the what the percentage of clinical hours to didactic hours to research hours are, and all of this is in is in one place, and it's very very explicitly listed. Hmm. Um, and I also had found that when I had. Um, for example, I, I emailed Penn um, to find out. I emailed all the, the program directors at Penn to find out more about the program. And when I had done this in England, they, if they, some, most of the time they didn't even respond. But if I did, they would tell me that you know I, I have to do DCT one, and they, they would kind of dismiss me. They wouldn't give me, they wouldn't help me or encourage me to apply. When I emailed the directors in the US, you know, one. Um, the, he was the standing uh, chairman of the program, Dr. Yuri Hangorsky. He emailed me back and he gave me his, his personal phone number and we had a phone conversation for about two hours. Um, and I just, it was, I've never had that experience yeah. before. So they were very much, um, in, very, very much encouraging. Yeah, it uh, just fuels your enthusiasm, doesn't it? And you, absolutely. That probably makes you think, do you know what? That's the place I need to go there and, or I, that's for me because this this enthusiasm it's just oozing out to me and it's it's so encouraging to hear i hope that that you keep that enthusiasm up um my next kind of question is is kind of double pronged so practicing in the u.s if you i'm not going to ask you what your life plans are because i'm going to try and attract you back to to leeds um <laughs> but how how do you go about because obviously the uk degree is not an equivalent degree to work in the states so how yeah. does that work um and do you have to sit boards etc could you stay there and also what what do you come out with at the end of this program and is it two years three years my, my program is three years okay so what what happens at the end and where can you work can you stay there yes so um the i mean i, I get asked this this question quite a lot and, and it's very very complicated because every single state has different rules. So yeah. if you graduate, even, even an American who does dental school in the US, if they graduate in one state, they don't automatically have a license in the next state, which is, is just, it's so outdated, but um, it, it's the system that, that exists. Um, so in terms of, in, in the US, they are licensed as general dentists. So in England, you have general dentist, and then you have the specialist register. In the US, no such thing exists. So there's no formal, um, you know, MCLIN DEN or, or um, you know, specialist degree. You do get a certificate in um, periodontics. So I, I'm, I'm doing a master's as well. So I'm going to get, okay. if I'm able to graduate, I'm going to get a, a, what they call here a certificate in periodontics, um, but also I'll get a, another master's as well. Um, in terms of working after, uh, after I graduate. So there are a few options to stay in the US. So in order for me to work in the US, I would have to have a um, DDS. Yeah. Okay. That would give me free movement for, to any state in the country. So that would mean going back to dental school and doing the third and fourth years 
um, the two year program, which yep. is, is very expensive. And because it's, it's very, it's very expensive because it's not a postgraduate degree. So getting scholarships is, is very difficult to do. Um, and it's very time consuming as a periodontist specialist. I wouldn't recommend going mm. back to do that. Um, there are other alternatives. So one alternative is to um, work as a professor in a, in a university. Okay. You can work there for, um, you know, three years. And what they do is they'll often offer you uh, a reduced salary, which is still, um, you know, significantly better than you would get in a, in a training program. Uh, if you've got a hospital uh, job in, in the UK, they give you a reduced, a reduced salary. And in exchange for the reduced salary, they would give you at the end of your three years, they would let you take the exams to what they to get what they call a faculty pass p a s s pass okay. is like the conversion um, right so you either go back to dental school and just do normal pass or you can do faculty pass okay after faculty pass you can work in any state in the in the country um so there is one other option uh, that you can pursue and this would be more of a restricted license um and that would be so with a as a foreign trained dentist with a speciality certificate in the US, if I did the national um, and national board dental examination, so it's it's actually now integrated, so it's a two day exam, a theory exam, and then you did this ex- uh, a practical exam called the ADEX exam, you can work in seven states. Um, those seven states, off the top of my head, they include Texas, um, Virginia, Washington State. Uh, I think Iowa. I'm not sure on, on the others, but those are the, the biggest states. But it's not. It's nothing like you know. Yeah. People often reference New York or California or something. Your like liberties, yeah. It's not, it's not those states because um, they're very saturated. They don't want foreign dentists uh, coming yeah. in. There is there is a way to do it, but it, it's much longer. Um, so essentially, I can do the, um, I can do the NBDE, the National Board Exam, and the ADEX Practical Exam, and I can work in seven states. So there is definitely an option for me to, to yeah. work here. So, um, to, put, to put it into context, so I actually did the NBDE. I think I took it about six weeks after I moved. And I, I, people in dental school, they take two, two months, two, three months. With the training I had at Leeds, I was very well prepared for it. Um, okay. You know, we have a lot of like, I think that I still remember the modules, IOE, Introduction to Oral I think I, I remember IOE one and IOE two, the two modules at Leeds that we, we learned, but it, it covers a lot of like the microbiology, the, the pharmacology and that kind of thing. Um, I think the training in, in England, the, the, what you get with the BDS is puts you in a very good position to, to pass these exams. Um, you know, it's nothing you, ha- you haven't done before. Okay. Um, so then, and then the practical exam is, um, I haven't taken that, that one yet. Um, but it, it's there. If I okay. Need to. Good. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 as for my future, I, I don't know. It depends. Well, I think I, it's it's difficult. Oh, that's a really unfair question for me to ask you, to be honest. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it it sounds great. I mean, the perio is a specialty in the US. Is it very? Di- and I know this is. You know, I'm an oral surgeon, and I get a little bit twitchy about perio and restorative jumping into our field and overlapping, but. <laughs> You certainly perio here is very much uh, implant orientated, surgically orientated, and it is, I'm getting the vibe that that's that's very similar in the US. Yes, um, yes, I would agree. I mean, you can you can look at the uh, the longitudinal studies and look at the different uh, just the differences in their management of periodontitis in the, in the classical studies between the European studies and the US studies. Um, but um, one, one actually, what's interesting is when I was in working as a foundation dentist, I actually, you know, I actually don't think that I had any idea how to treat perio disease. A tooth would come in with a, a deep probing depth, you know, um, BP four star, and then uh, you'd get the probing depth is like nine millimeters, the tooth is mobile. I think nine times, if not 10 times out of 10, I would take the tooth out. Yeah, I, I, I'm i in second year and I think I've taken one I don't, I don't even know if I've taken a tooth out yet due to perio disease. Interesting. Um, so really like uh, it's changed my mind on, on how I yeah. treat patients, which I think is really neglected in, in, in England. 
Okay. Um, but I, I also, I think that's largely just due to the, the healthcare system. I don't. Yeah, I was just going to say I, it's. I don't. It's you know, I'm spending sometimes. Yeah. I'm spending two hours just scaling a one quadrant. Um, Exciting. So, so, yeah, I know. I know. But uh, no. But in terms of we we do a, um, we we do a lot, a lot of we get a lot of surgical experience. And again, one of the the best things about the US is that there's no restrictions on what you can do because the patient. At the end of the day, it pays for everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very different to to yeah um, an NHS funded program. Okay, so I think uh, I did say we're going to go off a little bit off piste with the clinical chatter. It's really interesting to hear about the training, and I'll watch this space with anticipation to see what happens to you when you go or where you return to. But your your current research interest this obviously links into your master's program. Um. When we chatted before, I invited you onto the podcast, and you said about this research, I had to look it up. But we're going to, or you're going to talk to me a little bit about um, periodontal phenotyping. Yes. So, um, in the 2017 World Workshop of uh, Classification of Periodontal Disease, they there used to be a terminology called periodontal biotype, and people often often reference that. Um, and they recently changed the uh, the definition to something called periodontal phenotype. So for those who don't under, who don't have a clue what, what we're talking about, um, the periodontal phenotype includes the gingival thickness. So the thickness um, of the gingival tissue, which if you look in like that, if you look in all the, the studies and, and even the, the consensus reports, how they measure it now is they use a probe and they put the probe into the sulcus and it's whether the probe is visible or not. So it's not very scientific uh, measurement, but that, that's <laughs> what we, we have so far. We have a thick or a thin um, gingival thickness. And then the other thing we, we look at for periodontal uh, phenotype is the, um, sorry, the, the, yeah, we have the, uh, the width of the keratinized tissue. So that's the second component. So we have gingival thickness and the width of the keratinized tissue. And the third thing, um, which is really important, which is always overlooked, is the, the thickness of the labial bone. Um, so that's known as the bone morphotype. So um, to summarize, the periodontal phenotype is made up of the gingival thickness, the keratinized tissue width, and the bone morphotype. Now, why this is so important, um, there, you can look at like the classic paper by Lang and Lowe, and they suggest you know two millimeters of um, keratinized tissue for for gingival health, especially if someone is having like a orthodontic treatment or, or any restorative treatment. Um, but with um, orthodontic treatment nowadays, we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of patients, especially those who use clear aligners, um, you know, 10 years down the line, they're having this really, really severe gingival recession. And one reason for this is because a lot of dentists, you know, they, they inherit huge debt when they go to dental school and they start doing Invisalign and they start mm. doing Invisalign because they can make, uh, you know, a quick buck uh, and Invisalign looks great. They can boost their social media uh, profile and, and Invisalign is, is really, it does really wonders for patients who, um, you know, improves their confidence and, and that, that kind of thing. But the thing with Invisalign, which is, is never spoken about, um, is Above the gums, the teeth look great. They look straight, but beneath the gums, what is happening? And they're pushing the, the roots in any, any direction they can just so that the teeth look straight. Now, what we've seen in, in our patients, which we treated is that, um, often these roots are pushed through the labial plate. So their phenotype is, they now have a, a thin or patients who have thin periodontal phenotype and they push the roots through the buccal plate. They're left with this really severe um, recession. Um, so they, in the, they made a consensus paper, the AAP made a consensus paper in 2017, looking at the influence or, of, or the benefits of phenotype modification therapy, where you take, you look at these three components, the gingival thickness, the keratinized tissue width, and the bone morphotype, and how increasing or changing those, or converting those components, um, and can favor health. Um, and I think it's it's really re it's going to be really relevant in the next ten to fifteen years, um, as we see you know the the post because right now we're very much in the clear aligner. Era. Yeah, it's but definitely. What, what's, 
what's yeah. going to happen in the post clear aligner era you know yeah i mean it's it's hugely popular here and I, i'm guessing it it's even more popular in the states that uh, and we've even got you know adverts on tv for for aligners and things so it, it's definitely in the public domain and it's interesting that you know these complications that are just starting to creep through but you're right in the next 10 to 15 years it's it's going to hit the headlines probably isn't it have you have you ever seen anyone ever speak about what's happening beneath the gum when they're using a line of no. therapy yeah it's... um so I, I think it's just taking the dots and drawing them together um but if um yeah I, I, as i say the the latest consensus they couldn't the the conclusion was is there wasn't enough evidence to make any definitive conclusions yet so we're trying to just look at um, the influence of um, phenotype modification. Uh, yeah. One thing that they're doing with orthodontics as well is they're, they're taking a similar approach. So phenotype modification can be performed either before uh, orthodontic therapy or aligner therapy or after. Okay. Um, ideally, ideally before. Um, so that it means that you have, you know, increased alveolar housing that you can move the roots further. Yeah. Uh, but they're also looking at um, something called uh, periodontally accelerated osteogenic orthodontics, so PAOO. Um, you may have heard of Wilco Orthodontics uh, mm. in the past, um, but essentially what they're doing is they um, they're doing the the bone graft at the same time uh, as they apply orthodontic forces, um, and they're also um, they're doing corticos. This is slightly off off topic, but it's just another. When, when you do the phenotype modification during the procedure, it's called PAOO. Um, and the idea is, is that if you, um, and this is not for clear aligners, this is just for traditional orthodontic therapy. Also, yeah. but if you if you do, um, if you surgically injure the bone, you have, there's, it introduces this regional acceleratory phenomenon. So if you have, if you take your arm, for example, your arm is uh, always turning over bone, you know, the bone is being destroyed. Uh, by osteoclasts and then being reformed by osteoblasts. It's always happening. Um, when you injure yourself, so when you fracture your arm, that whole uh, bony turnover is increased. So the bone is, is being um, turned over a lot more rapidly. And so the thought behind this is it started off with um, basically just doing corticotomies in, in the labial plate, um, surgically injuring the bone, increasing the bone turnover. Mm -hmm. And that allows teeth to be moved, obviously, if the... Um, the bone is, is um, it's more porous. It is being turned over more uh, often. Uh, and that allows people to move the teeth further and more quickly. Um, and then they're doing the, the phenotype modification at the same the same time. That's just wow. like a, uh, I mean, that, that's been uh, going for, you know, 20, 20 30 years. Yeah. Um, but it's just people are now talking about it in the US a lot more. Um, I don't know if I've ra rambled on, a lot that no, no, it's interesting, and and it, you know, it's just interesting to find out what research that you've picked up on. Uh, I mean, certainly corticotomies. I'm aware of. I don't know how popular they are or common the place in the UK, but certainly, you know, I know people are using piezo systems to do those um, to yeah. for assisted orthotherapy. So it's interesting. Do, but it's, when, when they do that, do they do the do they use the bone graft at the same time? Yeah, uh, and uh, I, I guess all this links into that you know, what's going to happen in 10 to 15 years when all these patients who had their Invisalign um, for however many months, are, are they going to run into bother? So traditionally, patients patients with, um, this is like floating in between, because PAOO and phenotype modification, they're related, but they can also, you know, you can talk just on PAOO for, for hours uh, and the, you know, the different points of view with, with that treatment. Um, but with, um, with gingival recession, Historically, you know, you have some recession, people do a soft tissue graft. But the issue mm. is if there's no labial plate, so it's just yeah. the teeth and the, 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 the soft tissue is always going to follow where the, the bone is. If there's no bone, the soft tissue is not going to be there. So what we're trying to look at is the relapse of gingival recession after um, soft tissue grafts in patients with the, the, the thin bone morphotype. So if you if you go back to what I again what I was explaining at the start what what a periodontal phenotype is made up of we're trying to make a decision tree so if you have thin um, yeah. thin gingival tissue and a thick bone morphotype then you're fine just to go and do a soft tissue uh, graft yeah. 
But if you're having the, the thin bone morphotype, maybe what we're trying to look at is if it is it better to actually do bone augmentation um, okay. with the soft tissue graft. So that that's kind of what we're we're looking at. And I presume you are using CBCT for your um, bone morphotype. Yeah, and analysis, again, yeah. we're trying to we we're trying to look at micro CT because CT is, is sometimes can be you know depending on the thickness of the slices can be yeah um, lost. But uh, I, I think I'm it's. I'm sure it's just not our, our, our way of trying to look at it, but, but loads of people uh, yeah. are looking at it. I think it's like the, the hot topic. Uh, and um, graft material, which I'll kind of lead on to this because it's a bit more me and oral surgery. What What's your kind of preference for graft material just for this kind of work and, and generally with, uh, you, know, you know, for implants? Yeah, so we, we, we use... Um, uh, again, a big difference between the US and, and the UK. We we don't use. I'm think I've used Xenograft maybe like two times. Okay. Uh, we we predominantly we use Allograft. Yeah. Um, it, it's inter- I mean, I think we're moving more that way. Certainly in in the hospital, we we're using Allografts. Um, I've recently started using them privately. So I think we are we are the shift is there, and I don't know what what's really driven that shift. Whether it's patient driven. Um, or quality of graft, I suspect it's probably a combination, but maybe more of the latter. I don't know what. Um... Yeah, I always, I always thought that it wasn't, they were having license issues. Getting... Yeah, probably. I mean, if we can get an allograft in the NHS now, which we do, then it, I guess we've we've broken the back of that. But I suspect... Yeah, I mean, do you, do you, do you have many issues with xenograft? Um, no. Uh, just... how, how, long would, how long would you usually wait after, say, a... A ridge preservation or a GB. Uh, I think I think it's topic, really right? patient dependent. Um, six to eight months, I think, is is probably depending on how much work you've done and what what your plan is. Um, whereas that's probably a little bit reduced with your allografts. I don't know what your protocol is. So if if for example, um, if say for for GBR we would wait longer. And when I, when I say GBR, I mean well we say if there's a, a big defect. And we take the two that big defect and we would graft and try and obtain a primary closure. But if we were yeah. doing just a, a standard ridge preservation, we would we would wait no more than you know, four months um, okay. with, with allograft. Um so yeah, and, and you know, I I haven't had too much experience with the xenograft, so I I can't comment. I can just talk about what how I've been been trained. Yeah um, and what I've been taught. But they've really when when we do a procedure we obviously would explain which graph you want to use and i haven't had too much um too much luck trying to uh convince one of the faculties to let me use the xenograph too much <laughs> but, uh, and what, what are patients thoughts on allografts that do you have much issue with that or is it is it commonly not, accepted not, i think it's pretty commonly accepted yeah i actually yeah. even we've started using a lot of like um allograft soft tissue materials okay the patients are very you know if you say okay we, we need to do a soft tissue graft um, we can either take it the tissue from your palate that you're going to have you know, bleeding and, and pain, pain and, um, <laughs> yeah. or we can, take it, we can take it from a packet. Um, yeah, we'll have the packet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some 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 uh, areas we're not quite there yet. You know, um, the autogenous is is still mm. more aesthetic, yeah. but I think considering like, from what I understand on the history of, of bone grafts, the, the advancements they've the materials have made in you know the last couple of decades. Oh, it's phenomenal. huge! Yeah, so I think yeah. We'll, we'll be there. We'll be there soon. Yeah, interesting. And um, PRF. Yeah, we co- I commonly mean, I used. Actually, I so I went to the uh, the BSP conference, the British Society of Perio, and they had you know some of the leaders in, in PRF, um, some of the the guys who really pioneered uh, the, the or like made all the the papers on on mm. PRF. It's very. <laughs> The more traditional faculty members, they don't like us using it. Um, okay. I, I like I like to use it. I think it it's um, it makes sense. Not like in terms of a biologics point of view, it just makes yeah. enough sense. Um, however, there are no long. I I'm not aware. I'm, I may be wrong, but I'm not aware of any long term studies that show that it it's superior in, yeah. the, in the long term to not doing it. So they, I mean. I routinely use it just for the experience, and I think it does enhance the wound healing. 
um, especially in, yep. especially in the, in the you know the, the immediate phase two week two weeks. Um, but their their argument is well after three months, what difference does it make? Yeah, um, which again I I can't disagree with. So. The, it's, no, the, a, it's a bit yeah. the, the, I think it was everyone in the US was using it like five ten years ago and now if you for example if you present this in, in like a presentation they would they would always say to you well what why would you do it what what difference does it make yeah um, I, I like to say my, my rationale for using it in terms of like the the initial healing anyway is um, I think that um, with especially with GBR I think you can have uh, less chance of you know uh, incision line opening if you have mm. um, all the growth factors there and, and that kind of thing but they're, they're not massively you know it's still in the US anyway they is, can be controversial yeah no I think you're right it's the same here um, and certainly things like sockets prevention of emronge and things like that um, and alveolar, uh, alveolar osteitis it's you know there's no real strong evidence good quality RCTs out there but um, anecdotally it, it just but at, at, the, at the BSP, they were talking about. Um, I mean, I think it was like must have had at least six or seven lectures on PRF, oh. um, and they were looking at they were measuring the speed of healing based off uh, thermostat, like a temperature of the area. It was all very intricate, but it was then I was just thinking like, what the bigger picture? Mm. What uh, what's the long term benefit? Yeah, benefit. Yes. Um, I think if it was me, if it was my mouth, I think if you could use it or not use it, I, I would. I don't know. I would think I would like to use it. I think it makes yeah. sense from a biological point of view. Uh, it, but it's but un- from from a from evidence point of view, I, I wouldn't be able to say it's superior than it's tricky, than isn't it? Else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, it, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you, Brad, and I'm um, I'm pleased we've kept in touch. And it's really interesting to hear kind of what's going on the other side of the pond, and also your story. And I hope that people listening um you might get bombarded with people might be googling you so i apologize for that um but it's certainly really interesting and I, i'm really pleased that everything's going well and you're very passionate about perio despite not being an oral surgeon trainee yeah. um but you know i can't win every battle so um <laughs> no, yeah th- thanks, thanks, for- thanks for me. i i really appreciate um, everything you've done for me and i, I wouldn't be here if you didn't get me excited about uh, surgery in the first place so um, thank you thank you for, for everything it's a, it's a pleasure um, so yeah uh, thanks very much and uh, we'll chat soon absolutely take care thank you very much for listening to this podcast and any resources will be linked in the description please do leave a review and rate the podcast on the iTunes store I hope you join me for the next episode goodbye for now